I think you will forgive me if I skip the scripture reading and go right to the message today. It's there so that you who want to read it are able to. Do you need a better you, an upgrade, maybe a new model with better mileage, higher safety ratings? Do you ever find yourselves wanting to download a new version of yourself, one that's faster? Many people think that's what they need, an upgrade. They don't feel like they're up to speed. They haven't achieved enough, done enough, been good enough, earned enough brownie points with God to assure themselves of salvation. Studies tell us that even many good Christians are still in doubt. They have heard the words, by grace you have been saved and by grace alone, not by your own works. However, back in the deepest part of their brains, they fear more than grace is needed. Today we continue our discussion on recipes for relationships the ingredients that God has stirred up in our hearts to form loving, lasting relationships with his people. Think about it. A true covenant, a commitment with one another. Is it possible without grace? How would covenant be possible? We are human beings. We fail one another. We don't always keep every promise we make. We don't always speak, act, or think, much less feel, within the boundaries of God's will. Grace is that which makes covenant possible. God has given us grace in order for a relationship to exist. Without grace, none of us can be in healthy relationships with one another. Covenant without grace is contractual. Instead of relationship, it's law, a relationship based on a rigid contract. Sometimes Christians get caught up in the legalistic lifestyle to the point where grace is no longer present. When a family system is based on the law, the family will find itself disillusioned in the end because none of us can perfectly measure up to the ideal. A demand for flawlessness only adds guilt to the failure that will come. In an atmosphere of grace, family members respond out of love and forgiveness for one another. Sometimes when we think of grace, we think of something that's intangible. And although grace is intangible in some respects, in other ways, it's very tangible. There is nothing more tangible than Jesus hanging on the cross. Christ's crucifixion is a manifestation of grace. Grace is also something that manifests itself in people. We have words to reflect this when we say, someone is gracious, or someone graced you with your presence, with their presence. The incarnation of Jesus is the best example of the manifestation of grace. He became flesh and dwelt in our midst to redeem humanity, to reconcile the world to God. And in bringing us this grace and mercy, Jesus makes it possible for us to share that grace and mercy in our relationships with one another. Our epistle lesson is a wonderful example of grace being seen and experienced among Christians. The early Christians covenanted with each other to be there for one another, whatever the circumstances. Paul experienced such covenant throughout his ministry. In Philippians 1, 3, Paul gives thanks for grace, the grace and the graciousness shown to him by the Philippian congregation. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy. Partnership with each other was possible because of their partnership with God through Jesus. Partnership with God through faith in Jesus always produced a wonderful love and kindness for other Christians. 
in response to God's commitment to them, these early Christians sent gifts of love to Paul, helping support his ministry. Grace was evident, God's grace working among his people. Paul adds, it's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Grace is not something based on the merits of the person or the circumstances surrounding the situation, but it is undeserved love and mercy. Our Savior demonstrated his love for us by saving us. He died for us. We were imprisoned in the bondage of sin, death, and the power of the devil, all because of all our own doing. We were God's enemies, Paul reminds us, but we have been reconciled to him through the death of Jesus, Romans 5.10. Actor Kevin Bacon recounted when his six-year-old son saw a footloose for the first time. He said, hey, Dad, you know that thing in the movie where you swing from the rafters of that building? That's really cool. How'd you do that? Kevin responded, well, I didn't do that part. It was a stuntman. What's a stuntman? That's someone who dresses like me and does things I can't do. Oh, he replied and walked out of the room looking a little confused. A little later, he said, hey, Dad, you know that thing in the movie where you spin around on the gym floor, on the gym bar, and land on your feet? How did you do that? Kevin responded, well, I didn't do that either. It was a gymnastics double. What's a gymnastics double? That's a guy who dresses in my clothes and does things I can't do. There was silence from the sun. Then he asked in a concerned voice, and what did you do? And Kevin replied, I got all the glory. That's the grace of God in our lives. Jesus took our sin upon himself and did what we could not do. We stand forgiven and bask sheepishly, triumphant in Jesus' glory. There's more in your outline, but I am going to stop there today.